This is Lecture 3 in the FOA series of lectures on premises cabling. In this lecture, we'll talk about cabling standards. Practically everything about premises cabling is standardized except the name. We refer to it as premises cabling because we like to include some types of cabling that are not included in structured cabling, which is the name for the standard. So other people refer to it as VDV cabling for voice data and video, data cabling, low voltage cabling, limited energy cabling, telecom cabling, teledata cabling, and there are probably a dozen others. But what we're talking about is standardized structured cabling. What is structured cabling? Structured cabling is a standardized cabling infrastructure developed by standards committees comprised of vendors who develop specifications for their cabling that ensures interoperability of networks designed to run on them. It's a flexible cabling scheme designed to not be specific for any application. It's designed to support voice and data and even digital video for short distances to allow easy moves, adds, and changes and upgrading to different network types as long as they meet the specifications of the cabling. It's not mandatory like the National Electric Codes, but it's followed for interoperability. Here's a typical architecture for a structured cabling or premises cabling system built to structured cabling standards. There's basically a equipment room or computer room that connects over backbone cabling to wiring closets, telecom closets, or telecom rooms, as they may be called, that include patch panels, hubs, power, ground, and other electronics that connect via horizontal cabling direct to workstations or to wireless access points. Cabling standards also include things like power over Ethernet, standards that allow you to power devices over the cable that you're sending data on. This is a typical diagram, but it can be changed a lot even within the realm of the standards. The original use for structured cabling was computer networks, but now many other types of systems are designed to operate over UTP or fiber cable, including security and closed circuit television systems, intrusion alarms, public address and audio systems, building controls, and the like. While coax is still primarily used for video, IP video is used for a lot of systems over normal structured cabling. Structured cabling standards are standards written by and for manufacturers, not in users or installers, which is a common misconception. What standards do is create, as the head of the Ethernet committee once told us, mutually agreed upon specifications for product development. The manufacturers use those specifications to create products that may exceed the minimum specs of the standards because that provides them with a competitive advantage. Manufacturers, manufacturers alone, are supposed to provide an interpretation of the standards for installers and users because the standards themselves are not written for installers and users. You should refer to the manufacturer's directions for the use of their product, not the standards. The standards themselves were developed from an original 1982 survey done by AT&T when they were looking to change over from POTS, plain old telephone service, to digital PBXs. What they found was that virtually all stations or phones were less than 300 feet away from their wiring closets, and 95% of all desktops were within 50 meters. Those dimensions basically became what we now think of as industry standards for structured cabling. In the U.S., structured cabling is based on work by the EIA 
TIA TR42 committee. It's usually called the 568 standards, but it's really the 568 standard for building telecommunication standards, 569 for wiring pathways and spaces, 570 for residential telecommunications, 606 for administration, and 607 for grounding and bonding requirements. At the current time, 568 is in its C revision, but it's being revised continuously, so you really don't know how to find exactly what each standard is in the latest version unless you're a manufacturer attending the standards committees. Similar standards are in use around the world, generally based on the ISO IEC 11801 standard, cabling for customer premises. There are other similar ISO IEC standards for administration, documentation, planning and installation, testing, and many more, hundreds of them in fact. And this is one of the reasons that end users really aren't part of what is intended as users of these standards. They're really for manufacturers and the manufacturers should take these standards and use them to create documentation for their users. The other thing is that the US standards are becoming rapidly the same as international standards. So it's very often the same US standard in the international structure and vice versa. 568 architecture looks like this, but the way it's defined has been changing over the years. The original nomenclature came from the telephone company. So the master equipment was in the main cross-connect, there would be intermediate cross-connects, telecom closets or wiring closets, and telecom rooms. All of these words really only talk about the same locations, but the, nom the nomenclature has been changing over the years. There is a page on the FOA website on premises cabling that will link you to a basic history of these nomenclature changes and what the current system calls for. But generally people refer to rooms as the equipment uh, room, the telecom room, and the work area. Backbone cabling is what we call the cabling that runs from equipment rooms to telecom closets. While it may be unshielded twisted pair, or even screened or shielded twisted pair cabling, as long as it meets the same performance specifications. In enterprise networks, it tends to be more multi-mode fiber, typically today 5125 OM2, 3, or 4 rated fiber, or single mode fiber, because of the higher traffic on the backbone and the higher bandwidth required. Horizontal cabling is a cabling that connects the work area to the telecom closet. Or in today's network, it also connects wiring access points back to the telecom closet. It can be UTP or shielded or screen twisted pair or multi-mode fiber. Although it's today usually unshielded twisted pair cables, one for telephone and at least one for data. With the advent of wire, wireless networks, Less and less workstations or work areas are being cabled with copper connections. More and more are just simply relying on the wireless networks in the building. The distances for structured cabling are somewhat misunderstood. The distance for horizontal cabling is 90 meters of permanently installed cable plant plus 10 meters of patch cords for 100 meters distance. But if you're using unshielded twisted pair cable for voice, you can go 800 meters. And in backbones, multi-mode fiber can go 2,000 meters, two kilometers, or three kilometers for single mode. For various types of networks operating on structured cabling, the networks limit the distance for fiber to much shorter distances when you get up to gigabit and 10 gigabit and faster networks. So always refer to the network information for the standards on the length of cable supported. 
Numerous cables that have been used for networking and voice over the years are no longer included in 568 and 11801 international standards. Not included are any of the coax for thick net, the old ethernet coax cable, or thin net, the smaller ethernet cable. Satellite or uh, cable TV coax, RG6. RG59, which is typically used for closed circuit television and many other isolated cable types like the IBM cabling. Also not included at the current time is the ISO IEC Class F, which is a shielded cable, which is sometimes called Category 7. As we do this video, Category 7 is finally being considered by the TIA in the U.S., but is not yet a standard. With the proliferation of laptops, tablet computers, and smartphones, wireless is becoming the user connection of choice. All generally can connect over Wi-Fi, so Wi-Fi has been developed to provide adequate bandwidth for most users, and we're talking about 100 megabits per second. It's widely available, it's often free, and what it allows is mobility. You can take your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone to meetings, airports, hotels, and the like. What's actually happening is that wireless is replacing the copper connection to the desktop for most users. But wireless isn't wireless. What wireless does is replace the patch cord that typically connected the user into the network. It still requires wiring to an antenna, which in Wi-Fi terms is called an access point and it also requires power to the access point. Local area networks use UTP or fiber to connect the access point, and cellular phone antennas use either fiber optics or coax, typically. While wireless is popular for mobility, it has problems with interference and security, and those are being well addressed by current technology. Here's our network architecture diagram again and you can see where wireless fits in. Basically the access point is wired or cabled into the backbone system and is supported just like a desktop workstation would be. The wireless access points are located around in a facility like a building to provide coverage for a certain number of users and a certain geographic coverage and the design of wireless networks is actually quite sophisticated and requires considerable amounts of knowledge. One thing copper cabling can do that fiber cannot do is provide both power and signal transmission. Power over Ethernet is part of the IEEE Ethernet standard, not cabling standards, and provides for two different power levels, 13 watts and 25 watts of power, through powered switches or mid-span devices that provide the power to the cabling. It's useful for powering remote wireless access points, voice over IP phones, hubs, or switches without local power access. But all of these devices must meet the maximum power output of power over Ethernet, which is currently 25 watts, which means many devices will not work on power over Ethernet and require local AC power. There are some things that every contractor, installer, and end user should understand about cabling standards. 568 and its international equivalent was written by and for manufacturers, not network cabling plant designers, contractors, installers, or end users. The standards are written as agreed upon specifications for product development and the manufacturers develop the products that meet the standards. The manufacturers then become the best source for information on what the standards mean, how cabling systems are designed, and how components are installed. The best place to find out about standards is to go to the manufacturers websites or catalogs. And remember that these standards are always changing, so always ask the manufacturers what is the latest information? 
one thing to understand is that standards are not legally binding, like building codes and fire codes. You need to know those building codes and fire codes before you design and install a network cabling system. You use the standards and guidelines to install a network that offers interoperability, flexibility, and upgradability. But you always must be aware of the code requirements, especially current code requirements in the United States for abandoned cabling, which is supposed to be removed. There's lots more information on structured cabling, premises cabling, fiber optics, networks, and more topics on the FOA online reference guide. Go to the FOA website, www.thefoa.org, for more information. And be sure to see the other lectures in this Premises Cabling Lecture Series on YouTube.